Hello and welcome to the Nen World Review, your source for everything anime and manga. And today I would like to touch on the protagonist of the current Succession War arc in Hunter x Hunter, being Kurapika, and quite specifically, why this arc is more than likely going to see his exit from the series. So before we really get into the meat of why this is happening now specifically, I do want to bring up the idea that Kurapika's death is a foregone conclusion in the series. Not just because the arc of his character and general motivations, but because the author himself, Yoshihiro Togashi, has stated that Kurapika will be meeting his demise by the time the series is over. Now this statement gets thrown around a lot on the internet and very, very few people ever provide a reference to it, which annoys me to no end. But for posterity's sake, this was an answer that Togashi gave in an interview in Hunter x Hunter Volume Zero, which was a special publication that contains two chapters detailing Kurapika's past with the Kurt clan and ends with the news of their massacre. But also within the interview section of the volume, Togashi is blatantly asked, what will end up happening to Kurapika and the Phantom Troop? To which Togashi equally, if not more blatantly states, they will all die. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward answer there, I'd say. But I should also point out that this interview was published in 2013, and Togashi does have a habit of, you know, changing his mind about potential deaths when push comes to shove. So even with these words, Kropika's death is still not 100% guaranteed, but I think that the overwhelming evidence is very much in favor of him passing on, even without this Togashi comment. And it feels like we really have known this effectively ever since Kropika was first introduced into the story, given that his entire character is predicated on the concept of revenge. Understandable, revenge of course, given that his clan became the victims of genocide for the sake of profit, but his sheer determination to enact retribution has often twisted Kurapika from relatable protagonist into quite a terrifying and ruthless being, who under different narrative circumstances could even come to be considered a villain of the series. And I think that Kurapika himself summarizes this perfectly with some of the very first words he ever spoke in the series when he stated, I do not fear death. I only fear that my rage will fade over time. And I guess to be fair, that statement does also present a potential out if Togashi so desired to choose. For example, during whatever final conflict Kurapika has in the series, he could come to the realization that pure revenge is much less important than some other aspect of life and allow his rage to fade away as he feared in the beginning of the series. That would be one way to twist it into a lovely shonen ending. But at the same time, this is Hunter Hunter and this world is not known for being particularly forgiving to anyone, especially a character like Kurapika who on his mission to reclaim the scarlet eyes of his clansfolk has stated that he has lost something every time he managed to reclaim part of his brethren. And the kinds of people that Kurapika has targeted isn't limited to mafia figures, corrupt politicians, or even common criminals. Kurapika has also had to encounter more general people like doctors, musicians, and even a teacher to reclaim the scarlet eyes. And in doing so, he's had to resort to a lot of less than savory tactics such as threatening, bribing, coaxing, and various other methods. Although to his credit to this point, Kurapika has always managed to get what he wanted without killing the former owners of the eyes. Still, whether or not that means he did so without any form of violence or torture is left much more in the uh, ambiguous zone of thought. So I personally believe that Kurapika is going to continue down this path of self-destruction and inevitably end up paying the price for said actions. And if that were to happen, then there is no greater stage than the succession war arc for this climax. And for some context, let's remember the entire reason why Kurapika is even aboard the Black Whale One to begin with. It's so that he can obtain a large quantity of Scarlet Eyes in the possession of fourth prince of the Kakin Empire, Saradnik. And in fact, it's also heavily hinted that this is the last group of eyes that Kurapika needs to attain in order to complete his mission. And next up, this is pure speculation, but this seems to be an appropriate point to mention that there is a decent idea floating around that the eyes aren't everything at stake in the succession war for Kurapika. Saradnik is a well-known collector of body parts in general, and the centerpiece of his collection is a head that looks suspiciously like Pyro's, who was Kurapika's childhood friend. Now, once again, this is 100% speculation at this point, but it would make an awful lot of sense because it is being kept in the same section as the eyes of the Kurt clan. And if it were to be true, then it only raises the dramatic stakes for Kurapika because at this point, he is more or less used to seeing the dismembered eyes of his people. However, catching the sight of Pyro's head, well, that would push Kurapika into a whole new world of rage. One that I highly doubt he would ever recover from. But back to what we know for a fact, it is thought by Kurapika that Saradnik does possess the last of the eyes as stated before. So that is a mighty hint towards the nature of finality regarding Kurapika in the succession war. But before embarking on this voyage, Kurapika also lamented that even after completing his goal, he would have no home left to return to and nobody to welcome him back. So it shows that he is very much prepared for this to be where he meets his end. And while we're on this idea, let's also examine the owner of the eyes, Saradnik, because he is a very important figure. This man is far more than a random prince of the empire. And as events stand currently, he is most certainly being built up to be the primary antagonist of the succession war. With what he's demonstrated so far, even though he's only known about Nen for a handful of days, this man is not going to be easy to overcome, even for an individual of Kurapika's sheer power, intellect, and experience. 
At his disposal, Saradnik has not only one, but two Nen Beasts, one of which he conjured completely naturally and subconsciously, and he has even developed an incredible Hatsu known as Parallel Future, which allows him to very briefly see events to come. And once he actually learns to wield this in any form of adequate manner, it is going to be simply devastating in any battle situation. Furthermore, I also think it's worth noting that Saradnik is a specialist, if only for the fact that it correlates to Karapika's own Nen Affinity when his Scarlet Eyes are invoked. But it also presents a further challenge to overcome because specialists can't be boxed into typical and strategy. I really do think that if this arc is shaping up to be a conflict between Saradnik and Karapika, which every sign seems to point to, then it's going to be one hell of a hard fought battle, and something that I don't think Karapika is going to emerge unscathed from, if at all. But that isn't quite the end. Saradnik would certainly seem to be Karapika's natural opponent, but things have gotten far, far worse for our blonde revenge smith, because also aboard the Black Whale One is the entirety of the remaining Phantom Troop, a group that is tied more closely with Karapika than any other character in the series, bar Hisoka, I guess. But the Phantom Troop is incredibly important because they were the ones who conducted the actual genocide of the Kota clan and harvested the Scarlet Eyes to begin with. In fact, as a result, Karapika crafted Change Air, one of his most powerful abilities, with the strict condition that it could only be used against members of the troop. So this tie is not to be ignored, even though neither party are currently aware of the presence of the other. Right now, the Phantom Troop have their complete focus on finding and killing Hisoka, but the moment they realize that Karapika is on board, that is going to trigger a change in thought. Because when you think about it, Karapika is responsible for killing just as many members of the troop as Hisoka has, managing to dispatch both Uvagin and Pakunoda during the York New City arc. And also, it's not as if Karapika has no further investment in the troop either. The events of York New City in no way settle the score from his perspective, and if and when he finds out that the troop are present, all hell will break loose. And that's very much why Mizai Storm is currently grappling with the idea of whether or not to tell Karapika that he discovered them, so as to not add to the mental toll already consuming him as part of the succession war. So while the goals of the two parties are separate at the moment, narratively, it's just far too convenient that both Karapika and the troop have been placed on an isolated battleground for the next two months. Along with the Scarlet Eyes, it's as if every thread of Karapika's story is coming together, and I guess the thing to remember, if you do want to put stock into Togashi's quote, is that he wasn't just referring to Karapika dying, but the entire Phantom Troop as well, further connecting them in this story. But after all of this, you might be thinking, yeah, Saradnik and the Phantom Troop are pretty tough opponents, but Karapika is one of the most capable people we've ever seen in the series. Surely it's entirely within his power to take out both of them. And I don't necessarily disagree with that. But even if he were to overcome both, it is going to come at a significant cost. And to get into that, let's have a short refresher of exactly how Karapika is able to be the beast level combatant he is, which is through the use of Emperor Time. Emperor Time is a maddening Hatsu that Karapika only has access to when he has activated his Scarlet Eyes, which turn him from a Conjurer into a Specialist. And Emperor Time then goes on to allow him to use all fields of Nen at 100% efficiency from the perspective of a base Conjurer. So it essentially allows Karapika to max out his potential in any Nen category without having to go through all the training and mastery of them. However, in exchange for this ridiculous power, every second spent using Emperor Time shortens Karapika's lifespan by one hour. So that's pretty damn insane because if you even spend half a minute with it invoked, then you've lost over a day of your lifespan. And that adds up very, very quickly. And in fact, we've already had a situation in which an incredible chunk of Karapika's life was shaved off when he fainted. And as a result, he spent a total of 12 hours with Emperor Time active, thus removing five years of his life in one swift move. And look, you can say in a series like Hunter Hunter that that might be meaningless because characters tend to live much longer than humans in reality. But to those who argue that, I don't think you quite understand the horrific situation that Karapika is in. He is currently embroiled in a death match against 10 remaining princes and their parties, two of which are already Nen users, and a further one happens to be the unparalleled Nen prodigy, Saradnik. Meanwhile, Karapika serves the 14th prince, by far the most understaffed and under-resourced party. Karapika needs Emperor Time simply to stay competitive, let alone to come out on top, and the real kicker is that this voyage is supposed to last two months. So that is an awfully long and intense time to be operating. And of course, Emperor Time won't be active for the whole thing. In fact, it's not physically possible for that to be the case because Karapika would die in less than a week, but he's going to need to engage in very heavy and prolonged use to make it through this war. And all of this isn't even considering the amount of time he's already used the ability for whilst fighting the Phantom Troop originally, on his quest to recover the Scarlet Eyes elsewhere, and even when he was vetting candidates for the Hunter exam with the Association by using Dowsing Chain. 
everything adds up and the solution is not in Kurapika's favor. And that's something that he himself has flagged on multiple occasions now. He has blatantly stated that he must use it carefully or even the smallest mistake will prove fatal as well as that he was incredibly naive when setting the condition and didn't realize how truly dangerous this ability was. And logically, this all adds up towards his demise, but more importantly, it has been narratively flagged on multiple occasions. The idea of Emperor Time being a costly ability keeps being referenced, and there is most certainly a storytelling decision behind that, which I believe will culminate in you so extreme that it will heavily contribute to, or even cause, the death of Kurapika. And there you have it really. Whether it's the quest for the Scarlet Eyes and the setting up of incredibly powerful opponents, or the fact that Kropika's own abilities are rapidly depleting his very life force, there just isn't really a favorable solution at hand. I mean, unless something weird happens, like he ends up going to the Dark Continent, finding Nitro Rice and extending his life, but that seems very narratively dissatisfying. Especially for something like that to happen after the Succession War, because in theory, this should be tying up all of Kropika's remaining story threads. And from what we have to go on in the 2013 interview, Togashi's intention, was to kill Kurapika, and given everything that's happening now, I really don't think that that has changed. But that pretty much does it for my thoughts on the inevitable end of Kurapika. If you enjoyed this video and the content this channel produces in general, then please do consider donating to the New World Review Patreon, because the support of all of you amazing people is what continues to make this channel possible. And if Patreon isn't quite your style, then please do leave this video a like, share, or subscribe, because it also helps support this channel an incredible amount. And if you'd like to join the fun at any time, then please do head over to my Discord server, where a wide array of shenaniganry takes place on a daily basis. And finally, please do comment with your thoughts on Kurapika's final fate in the series. This has been the New World Review, and I'll see you next time.